Okay, good evening, everybody. I recognise some faces. Uh, Andy, good to see you here. Um, so my name is Graham Bradley, and I'm the uh, as a site manager with uh, DC. Um, so I'm responsible for reviewing this corrective action plan that we're here today to discuss for the 501 Pine Street Gatehouse lot. Um, so generally what I thought of, the, the general agenda this evening, I'm going to just set the context a little bit for today's meeting about the site, about the issues, um, about the objectives of this meeting. Um, and then basically we'll open the floor to questions, either questions to um, DEC in our role in reviewing and approving that corrective action plan. Um, but also we have some other people here today, uh, all other stakeholders um, on this project. So um, my name is Graham Bradley with Sites Management Section of DEC and my boss, <laughs> Trish, would you like to? Trish Capolino, the Senior Program Manager for the Sites Management Section. And uh, fortunate um, Mark Habedank. Mark Habedank, I'm the Remedial Project Manager with the EPA for this site. Okay. David, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm David Abrahamson. I'm an engineer with Nobis Group who prepared the corrective action plan. And Kirk, would you like to introduce Kirk Schuler, the uh, property owner. So those are the people here that are directly involved with, uh, with this project. Um, so I really just wanted to give you an indication of what my responsibility is, or our responsibility with DC in relation to other stakeholders. The landowner, this is private property, you know, and that comes with associated rights and responsibilities. City of Burlington, they're most directly involved with zoning and land use in terms of their local ordinance and uh, zoning construction occupancy permits. So that's in terms of how the land's being used. EPA, as I think um, members of the public here today know, um, this property is on the edge of the Superfund site. Um, hence Mark is here today. Um, and that is, uh, the issue there was coal tar from town gas production and that was basically uh, dumped out the back of the gas manufacturing plant. And uh, so um, back from the 90s and the noughties, there was a remediation plan put in place, a remedy for that, and that was mainly a containment rem remedy involving a sediment cap in the canal and the wetlands and the ongoing monitoring and maintenance and what we call institutional controls, making sure the land use is used appropriately. So that's the context of that. And then us, DEC, so we're the, we're the state authorities here and um, uh, we're responsible for sharing in com compliance with the, um, the long-winded version, the investigation remediation of contaminated properties rule, um, which most people involved in this in the state know as the I rule. Okay. Um, we're also involved with facilitating um, brownfield reuse. We're neutral in terms of how it's reused as long as it complies with the I rule. Okay, that is our responsibility. And then, of course, other people here today, neighbors, um, uh, budding properties, other impacted parties, and we're, we're having this meeting at uh, Andy's request, Friends of the Barge Canal's request, to, to hear your comments, to hopefully answer your questions, um, and um, look into your concerns and see if there is anything that we do need to respond to or anything that needs to be reconsidered to ensure compliance with the I rule. Okay, so that's, that's the different roles and responsibilities. So let me, let me ask you, are you going to stay that far away from that microphone? I hadn't thought about the mic. <laughs> if you like, I could. I'm a walker. I prefer to have a. <laughs> That's a second issue. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I can uh, I can use the mic. If you okay. Like. Let's just do this. <laughs> 
I taught uh, environmental geology at SUNY Oswego, and I was used to having a mic on my <laughs> I can put a longer cable on that. Okay, I'll be careful. So here's a general plan of the site. What we're talking about today is just this little blue box here, the, the gatehouse lot. It's uh, an historical quirk for whatever reason. I think was it of Vermont Gas. Uh, they, they had some kind of valves there, and this, this little so-called gatehouse lot was separated off and uh, so comes under different ownership. Um, to f the rest of 501 and 453, cur currently owned by companies uh, associated with Rick, Rick Davis. Other things to notice on this, just before I move on, so here's the canal itself. The, area, the properties immediately around the um, Barge Canal are currently zoned uh, conservation. And uh, the rest of the properties on here are light manufacturing. So that's the context in which we're working for. Uh, so it's not residential. Um, we're looking at standards in terms of uh, non-residential. <laughs> OK, so there's 501. What I've shown on here is, don't worry, I'm not going <laughs> to give you a whole lecture. I just want to give some background so we're all on the same page. This is the edge of soil that has uh, some kind of coal tar in it. Often that's just a sheen. There is areas where they're able to get coal tar at the ground still, um, black, goopy stuff. But most of this area, especially on the edge here, is just like a sheen. Um, closest to 501, it's in uh, peat, um, 8 to 12 feet underground, I think it is, uh, in that kind of range. Um, but this is what we're dealing with here. You see properties that don't have coal tar were actually cut out of the Superfund site. Um, historically, for whatever reason, the gatehouse lot was left in. Um, maybe if someone had noticed, it might have been taken out. OK, objectives of the meeting provide information. Hopefully that bit of background was useful. Um, comments and questions? forward to answering your questions, ensuring compliance with the IROL. That's our, our remit. Um, the corrective action plan shall be compliant with the specific <coughs> procedures and requirements established by the IROL to protect human health and the environment. So we're primarily focused on, on human health and the ecology. Um, and that's we're authorized to do that through the legislature. You can tell I was a <laughs> professor. I'm eager to, to give a presentation. I'm just going to go through these quickly. I'm just going to look at each of the media. I have a quick question. Go ahead. Uh, what are you defining as ecology here? Pardon? What are we defining as ecology? Oh, I, I'm not. I You're just not. use that in a general way. Okay. It's not a definition within the IRO. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good question, though. I've got to be careful what I say. <laughs> Soil. So that's what we've looked at first. Um, Nobis um, sampled the soil. So now we've just focused in on that uh, 501 gatehouse lot. Um, they sampled the soil, both near surface, four locations near surface and at the water table, because sometimes you get contaminants gathering at the water table. The only thing in the soil which was above our standards for non-residential soils was vanadium. And it was actually within a range where we've seen elsewhere that could be background, could be natural. It could be anthropogenic as well, though. We don't know. So the corrective action proposed by Novis for this on behalf of the landowner was basically an isolation barrier to make sure that anyone sitting on the grass in the food truck parking lot um, it's not going to be ingesting the soil. There's no chance of ingesting the soil. There's not a danger to human health there. Groundwater, they, uh, oh, by the way, you know, when I, I'm just putting in what was above the standard here. They, they checked, for if, if you're familiar with different contaminants, with volata volatile organic compounds, with PAHs, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are associated with coal tar, those were below the standards. Um, the same with groundwater, those were below the standards. The things that came out above standards were manganese and arsenic. 
very common to have uh, high concentrations of natural manganese in Vermont in the soil. The arsenic may be associated with industrial soils. What's the corrective action here proposed? Well, it, actually, it's not proposed because it's already there. It's one of those institutional controls associated with the Superfund site. This property and adjacent properties have something called the grant of environmental restrictions. So any landowner has to comply with that grant of environmental restrictions. They're not allowed to put a well in. You're not allowed to use groundwater at this site for drinking water. That's how we protect um, human health. Sol gas, it's, it's one of the media we check to make sure that there's uh, not vapors, contaminant vapors in the soil. You know, you can imagine if you have a truck, contaminant vapors coming up through the soil, whatever, and they get into the truck, there's a potential hazard there. None above the standards, no, con no corrective actions required. And this is my final slide. So this is what the landowner, how the landowner would like to develop the site. Our job is to make sure it complies with the I rule, but also, as I've mentioned, this grant of environmental restrictions, um, because that grant is between the landowner and the state. So I'm responsible for making sure that they comply with that as well. And that was put in place because of the Superfund site. Um, can't be used as residential and daycare, check, it's not being used for that. Um, can't put in drinking water wells, check, no plans for drinking water wells. Activities not to, uh, it's not allowed, not allowed to recontaminate the land in any way. Move that soil around, contaminated soil or new contamination, check. Shall not um, cause contaminant migration to Lake Champlain. That's through the groundwater. So in other words, we don't, we don't want to be putting lots of water, additional water in the ground here that might cause that, ground, that water table to mound up and push contaminants towards Lake Champlain. They're not doing that. They're actually trying to check the, the, the proposal in the corrective action plan is to try and change that uh, recharge as uh, little as possible. Sorry, I'm forgetting about the mic. Walker. Um, so um, uh, so the green areas, grass, the what would you call that beige? I, uh, uh, that's um, pervious. So the recharge able to get into that area. Um, runoff from the containers presumably will run into the ground as well. So that's going to remain unchanged. The only bit uh, with paving is that. Uh, that pull out there um, for cars moving into the food truck lot. So the other thing to think about that is that in terms of they're not they're trying to ensure there's no change to recharge, but also it's a relatively small lot. There's not a lot of recharge on this area anyway compared to the site as a whole. Um, I think it's about 13% of the area that's going to be paved between. Pine Street and the edge of this sheen, this napple here, and um, what was it? 3.4%, uh, 3.4% 3, 3. 4 of the whole of uh, 501 <laughs> lot. Graham, why does it matter how much, um, whether the manganese, the vanadium, the arsenic are anthropogenic or background? If the, if the contaminant is there, why does it matter where it came from? In terms of the corrective action plan, it doesn't, um, that we're dealing with it anyway. Well, it does, because we wouldn't regulate it if it's background. But, 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 the, reg but the corrective action plan yes. is dealing with it as if it is anthropogenic. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if it's background, we can't change the whole state to change the background. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, and then there are controls if, uh, for digging over five feet. And that's uh, in case there's any deeper contamination. As far as we're aware, that deeper contamination is closer to the lake, is, is further to the west. So that's my piece. Hopefully I haven't taken too long. Um, just to sort of describe the context. 
And so really, I'm just going to invite questions from anybody in the room, either, uh, and I, uh, I will answer questions from the point of view of our re a review and potential approval of the corrective action plan. If you do have some detailed questions about the cap, and I think David might be able to help with those answers as the engineer. Um, and then in terms of if there are any questions relating to the Superfund site, uh, we have Mark here as well who will be able to help answer those. Sure. I don't have specific questions. I do have a, uh, a statement that I wrote out. So, and frankly, I didn't know whether it was going to be me and you and that was all here. So I wrote a rather lengthy state statement. But um, uh, if you find questions in there, um, please, please feel free to respond to them. My name is Andrew Simon. I live uh, just down the street in the south end of Burlington. I'm, among other things, on the steering committee for the Ward 5 Neighborhood Planning Assembly, which meets in this room all the time, so it's a familiar space. I'm a retired teacher. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. I um, am someone who drinks water from Lake Champlain, so I have a pretty intimate interest in uh, the quality of the water and the health of the lake. I'm not a hydrogeologist. I'm not a soil scientist. I'm not an environmental engineer. However, as a concerned resident, I did submit comments about the corrective action plan, which I will reiterate briefly this evening. I've helped over the last year uh, coordinate a local volunteer group called Friends of the Barge Canal. Some people <coughs> who've been involved in that are here tonight. Uh, we've organized uh, four different trash cleanups on the Barge Canal site. Uh, we've removed tons of garbage. Um, We've brought together teams of volunteers to begin removing invasive species like uh, common buckthorn. Uh, and um, we have also, uh, in cooperation with Jess Rubin's group, Micro Evolve, um, have sponsored a bi monthly community science species inventory of plant, animal, and fungal species on, on the city land in particular, the, the zero Pine Street land. Um, and in the process, uh, uh, developing eco-literacy among uh, adults and kids who came, who've come. Uh, I've also spent the last year learning about the history of this land um, that's uh, now designated as Pine Street Canal Superfund site. Um, one of the s salient pieces of the history that struck me was the, the fact that in 1992, um, EPA um, under very different leadership at the time, uh, proposed a remedy for the site that involves basically take, removing all the contaminated soil, piling it into a toxic waste container, and uh, uh, opening up the rest of the site for, um, for development. Um, the plan was almost unanimously rejected by Burlington residents as unwise and even dangerous. The subsequent revised remedy worked out over almost five years by scientists as well as local residents um, removed almost no soil, largely left, as you, as you pointed out, Graham, the land alone to reconstitute an ecosystem, mandated regular monitoring of soil and groundwater, and created institutional controls to restrict the land use on the site. This was formalized in 1998 in the record of decision and the grants of restriction. I note this history because it was, in fact, government scientists and engineers who proposed the rejected remedy. It was local residents as well as scientists who organized to scrap the original plan and who actively participated in the study committee. The corrective action plan proposed by the Nobis Group for this tenth of an acre parcel at 501 Gatehouse leaves me with some con questions and concerns. I do understand that. Some of these issues step outside of the strict boundaries of the state's I rule, um, and thus outside of your division's purview. I still want to mention them in the record of this meeting. I also acknowledge and thank you, especially Graham, for the responses that you provided over, uh, over most of a year now, actually. Um, and, um, and, um, and I appreciate that responsiveness. I note um, that 
in, in passing that we, that is to say the group that's now become the Friends of the Barge Canal, has expressed a concern about some of these issues to the Development Review Board, to the Design Advisory Board, to the City Council, to, to the Department of Public Works. So we have uh, expressed a lot of these concerns in more appropriate jurisdictions. Um, the things that struck me in the, in the, um, uh, in the corrective action plan are um, the fact that, one, I felt like it failed to acknowledge that how the site connects and impacts on the surrounding parcels. Even though it's a small uh, site, um, it shouldn't be treated in isolation. The proposed changes to the land, like cutting down all the trees, uh, which now stabilize soil, create habitat, sequester carbon, and contaminants will clearly have a significant impact on the rest of the 501 parcel on Zero Pine Street, which is the city-owned parcel, and consequently on the Barge Canal on the lake. It's noted that the hydrological gradient, and this is in your uh, corrective action plan, goes generally to the west-southwest and the changes to the soil layers will likely have unknown impacts on the rest of the Superfund site. Even if monitored continuously, these impacts would be difficult or impossible to correct. Who has ultimate responsibility? This is a question which I think we should, could address tonight. For paying for future mitigations necessitated by this 501 gatehouse uh, project, Will the developer take on this reliability, or is it the taxpayers of Burlington or the state of Vermont who will pay for these impacts? Our expectation and the city of Burlington's expectation um, at this point is that the rest of the 501 parcel will be surrounding the gatehouse lot will be moved into conservation zoning. Are the impacts on this future conserved land being adequately taken into consideration in the, uh, the corrective action plan? Another concern is that I feel like favoring, you're favoring various kinds of isolation barriers over long-term remediation strategies. The remedial construction described in Section 2.1 of the Corrective Action Plan describes five different categories of isolation barriers, but this is the sole remediation strategy for the site. Long-term effective remediation, such as bio, myco, or phytoremediation, are completely left out. While the isolation barriers may be acceptable to I rule criteria, we suggest that a concern for real long-term remediation for future generations' use of this land would include other strategies. Indeed, the very definition of remediation needs to be reconsidered by state and federal regulators. I've been reminded that from a regulatory point of view, the remedy at the, at the PC, PSCS, which is the, the Pine Street Canal site, is complete and that the procedures and requirements established by the I rule to protect uh, public health and environment define the limits of DEC's regulatory authority. That was a quote, I think, from, from you, Graham. While this may, strictly speaking, be true, I assert that your charge to, quote, protect public health and the environment is a higher calling than facilitating brownfield reuse. You may not see them as, as contradictory, but but I would like to engage that discussion about uh, protecting uh, public health and the environment and balancing that with brownfield reuse in the sense of economic revitalization. Um, I found that I, I had questions about the soil management techniques and perhaps um, uh, our NOBIS representative could respond to that too. Um, described in Section 2.2 of the Corrective Action Plan, um, it seemed to me that there was potential contaminant migration into the air and soil to other parts of the Pine Street uh, Barge Canal site and surface water so close to Pine Street. Where will soils that, quote, exhibit signs of contamination such as free phase product, oily sheens, olfactory signs, and that exhibit PID readings greater than 10 parts per million above background be segregated and stockpiled on this 0.12 acre site that will be covered almost entirely by the proposed food court. Is covering a pile uh, of soil, uh, contaminated soil with uh, six mil plastic adequate to the task and will it be inspected daily as is proposed? Um, We've certainly seen past examples in Burlington. Um, I remember the, the whole pile of contaminated soil at Letty Park. 
that were inadequately stored, and there's some bad memories left over from those uh, situations. I, I wonder about the stormwater impacts. Um, the CAP anticipates that stormwater from impervious surfaces will not be allowed to enter the city stormwater system, so a robust plan for stormwater management must be included. Directing the stormwater to pervious sections of the property and or on-site infiltration structures does not seem adequate as a plan, especially given the increasingly heavy rainstorms caused by climate disruption. The reassurance in the uh, CAP that um, changes in hydrogeology during and immediately after storm events, it's not expected to have any substantial impact to off-site hydrologic conditions that would thus cause migration of contaminated groundwater to Lake Champlain. Doesn't seem that reassuring to me. Again, we are talking about a small project site that could have huge impact on surrounding parcels and on Lake Champlain. We note that the largest combined sewer overflow site in Burlington is here, next to DPW, in back of DPW, and lies to the southwest of the 501 gatehouse lot in the direction of the gradient. This CSO, while not an ideal system by any means, keeps the stormwater from basements and businesses and filters it through the barge canal before it reaches the lake. Last, I just want to say that the, some very fundamental reprioritizing and rethinking needs to go on. Besides the expansion of the official definition of remediation, we should be looking at a new understanding of the, quote, sensitive receptors mentioned in the I rule. As we have documented over these last months, there are many types of sensitive receptors at the barge canal, animals, plants, and fungi among them, along with human beings. All of these need to be taken into consideration when considering the right course of regulatory action. The State of Vermont and DEC have too long elevated economic revitalization over other priorities. I believe that the numerous crises that we are facing will force us to reorder that thinking. We must recognize that supporting the wildness of the barge canals, damaged land and water, is ultimately a better reuse of this brownfield. Brownfield, I hope, into greenfield. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> there are a lot of questions <laughs> in there. I was, I was trying to decide, now, do we stop and address that issue? Because I'm sure I won't remember all of them. There was a lot, yes. <laughs> As you know, the middle section of what you said there is, is basically contained in the email you sent right. that provided detailed, detailed answers to, to each of those. So I'm kind of, thanks. So I'm uh, trying to decide, um, you know, do I just read out my replies to each of these? I don't think that would, I think that would, uh, no. I agree. No, I don't think that. I, I don't think that's necessary. I think that it, some of these questions will come up in the in the discussion. If um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. David. David. If David, you wanted to address any of the things that I brought. Can I, up, can I go first? I just want to address one or two things that are based on sort of regulation. Um, so, um, in terms of. Uh, impacts to surrounding properties, you know, as, as I've sort of tried to lay out the, the, the I rule, um, we, we, uh, we don't regulate land use per se. It, it's basically how to mitigate those risks to, to human health, but also to the environment, as defined within the I rule by the standards that we have to work to. The, the concentrations of various contaminants in the soil, in the groundwater, in the soil gas, etc. cetera. Um, so in terms of off-site impacts, I've got to think about how can that, how does that um, contamination travel off-site or that how does whatever's going on-site, how could that impact off-site contamination? And the main sort of way that could happen is changes to the, the hydraulic gradient, as you mentioned. And you know, it's, it is important to keep in mind that in terms of that catchment area where the water is coming from and going to, this is a relatively small area. And, and the focus of the um, corrective action plan, which David can speak about in a moment, is to 
minimize that impact to recharge. Um, and it is worth sort of comparing this relatively small site where um, only a small portion of the site will be impervious compared to 453 Pine Street, where it potentially a much larger area of that property and a much um, may end up with a pervious, uh, sorry, semi-pervious or impervious cover. And so there, there, because of its size, there's a much greater potential for, off, for, for changing that hydraulic gradient and, chain, and, and influencing contaminant migration in the groundwater. So there, um, they're looking much more closely, uh, more investigation and groundwater modeling to address those impacts. So it, it really is a question of scale, and it's not just the scale of the site, it's the fact that um, uh, the proposed cap, and I'm defending my decision here, it's up to David to talk about the cap itself, um, to maintain recharge on that property. The other thing that just stuck out in terms of what you said was in terms of favoring particular um, remedies, corrective actions for the site, favoring isolation barriers rather than, say, long-term bioremediation, accelerated natural attenuation, as it's sometimes called. Where charged with ensuring that the proposed cap is fit for purpose. It meets the requirements of the of the I rule. Um, someone wants to go above and beyond that, that's that's up to them. That's we are required to follow the you know by the legislature to um, ensure that that corrective action plan is fit for purpose. It um, it is in compliance with the I rule. And so if the isolation barrier does that, that's acceptable. So if I could just jump in for a minute, it sounds like you, you jumped through the I rule. Um, and if you go specifically to it's section 35603 objectives of the I rule, it lists out how a corrective action plan should be written in order of priority and it's capping, leaving stuff in place, trying to manage on site. We have prioritized that use to stop digging stuff up and taking it off site and putting it someplace else or putting in some sort of um, active remediation system that removes some of the contamination but not all of the contamination. We've looked at lots of bioremediation, use of phytoremediation. In the end, we still have to get rid of the thing that sucked up the contamination, whether or not it's cottonwood tree trying to take up chlorinated solvents. The cottonwood tree now has all the chlorinated solvents and it does not destroy it. It's the same with mushrooms. We've looked at that. The metals stay in the mushrooms, and then you take the mushrooms off site and you have to do something with the mushrooms. And so it removes it from the soil, but it stays in the media that actually removed it. And so Graham is right, and what was put together is exactly in line with what the I rule says it needs to have and in order of the priorities that have been put there. To Brownfields, and I just need to jump in on this. Sure. We are directed to prioritize redevelopment of brownfields to stop the redevelopment of green space and stop sprawl and bring development to infill. Um, that is what we are charged with and what we are supposed to try and make happen. Um, when we get new bosses, we can have a different discussion, but we do have people that are giving us priorities to implement within the DEC. And, and the the governor has selected this specific area, 501 Pine Street, 453 Pine Street, as a priority for redevelopment. Redevelopment can no. be. So you need to speak up because no one can hear it back here. If you point the microphone down, maybe. The microphone won't help. No. It's oh, you mean to hear, here. here. Right. Yeah. The camera's fine. So redevelopment can be green space and it can be something built, but we are directed to prioritize redevelopment on 501 and 453. Well, you're absolutely right, Trish. I, I, I just want to say you're absolutely right that, that um, I have not studied the I rule in depth. And I, um, I don't expect that I ever will because it's not my profession. And, um, and I know that um, uh, professionals such as uh, people in the Nobis group 
do know the I rule really well and that I can't point to specific passages that would um, support my position. But, um, but it's good to hear you say that about priorities. I, I do think that it's an important thing to underline that the priorities come from the top mm -hmm. and, um, and that economic revitalization is a priority of this particular administration and that other administrations might have a different viewpoint on it. So I, I appreciate all your comments, but I just wanted to point out like where, where we are bound um, and what we are trying to move forward with, with, with this specific document. Did you have more to add, Graham? <laughs> Um, is there anything else you, uh, you know, because I gave you quite comprehensive replies to, to each of your questions. Is there anything, you did. any of those specifically you would like to talk about? Well, I, <clears throat> I, I would like to sort of throw out that, that, um, you know, while, you know, that you have studied the uh, other remediation strategies and that you've chosen the most cost effective and the, and the, uh, one that fits in best with this particular project that um, I'm hoping that, you know, these more long-term strategies that ultimately will benefit the, the land and the city um, uh, and the people here and the animals and the, uh, will, um, will be included into the, into the options in the future. Even though they take longer, um, they need to be studied more, um, and they need, uh, um, uh, and they do cause, bring up their own problems, like what do you do with the mushrooms, you know? Anyway, I don't need to say anything more. Yeah, I mean, you know, you go to conferences on cleaning up contaminated sites and bioremediation, accelerated natural attenuation, you know, take up whole sections of, of conferences. It's a, a recognized um, technique or techniques um, in particular circumstances. It's just that circumstances was not chosen in this case. Well, in a way, the Pine Street Barge Canal is an example of deciding on a natural attenuation strategy because instead of scraping off all the soil and containing it in a, in a container, um, it was decided that uh, the land would be left alone, essentially, and the result is that there are trees, there are plants, there's uh, uh, an ecosystem that's evolved from a pretty devastated site. So in a way, it's, it's an experimental uh, site for natural attenuation of, of toxins, wouldn't you say? When you say that, I just, I'm trying to remember the wording of the objectives. There is an objective within there for the Superfund site um, not to unduly influence how the site is developed, particularly 501 and 453. So that was left open at the time for, for those sites. Um, so they didn't want to pick a remedy that strongly influenced how those sites adjacent to Pine Street itself would be used in the future. As you've said, there's ongoing talks about potentially extending conservation land on the rest of 501. And if that happens, uh, we will look at that in the context of the I rule as well, particularly if there's uh, public access. And the last human health risk assessment was done in the early 90s. So again, just in terms of our remit of um, uh, ensuring compliance with the I rule, um, we're anticipating that a human health risk assessment would be required as well, and then. Well, you're talking about. Well, let's just talk about 501 Pine. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about personal. not the gatehouse lot. I'm talking about the rest of let's, 501. Yeah, let's focus on this cap. This yeah. Part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, it, but I'm putting it into context. Yes. Mm. Andrew, you you had a concern over the soil management, and I think Graham answered that, but whenever we're proposing to do work on a former industrial site, we're gonna have that contingency in there in case something does show up while they're digging, say, putting in a utility, and they see something, all right, we're gonna put it on six mil poly, then we're gonna to have to kind of stop things and see what happens. So there'll be, 
and part of this cap, there, there would have to be a qualified environmental professional overseeing all the soil work that's going to be out, going on out there anyway. So um, it's it's merely a contingency. We're not anticipating finding anything. We didn't find anything during the phase two investigation out there. So. And why is it that Vermont Gas held on to that small property? You seem to have the answers to that. What? What I believe, just based on what I've seen, there used to be a kind of a, a valving pit there. There was a small building above ground, and they called it the gatehouse. So I presume there were some gas valves in there for some old gas works. That continued to be used by by VGS after after the manufactured gas plant was shut down. I believe so. And how long do you anticipate the soil that would be dug up would remain on the site? It would, per I rule, it would be no longer than 90 days, but it would likely be um, probably somewhere between 45 and 60 days if it had to be removed. So it'd have to go through waste characterization, and then you have to procure um, transportation and disposal if it needed to go off site. And where does it get removed to? It depends what it what it is. Again, we're not anticipating anything here. So if it's non-hazardous, quite often it goes to uh, a landfill. It could go to Coventry. It could go to landfills in New York. And depending on the concentrations of whatever might be in it, it could even be used as daily cover of the real landfill uh, material. So. Could you repeat that last line louder? I couldn't hear. I'm sorry. The last sentence you said, I had hard, a hard time hearing. Oh, so whenever you're, you're disposing of soil, the receiving facilities will look at the concentrations of contaminants that are in it, and they'll make a determination of whether or not it goes in as just landfill material or if it's used as daily cover. At the end of every day, they cover up the cells so they don't smell and they use soil and they try not to use clean soil <laughs> so they'll use maybe mildly contaminated soils or something like that within the permitting um, within their permit so. and are those landfills contained um most are i know coventry is so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to add something. My name is Brianna. Um, I came up to Burlington in 2017 to go to University of Vermont, and I'm living in Underhill now. Um, I have a lot of love for Vermont. I have a lot of love for Lake Champlain. Um, and now for the Barge Canal, I connected with this land first in this past summer and joined Friends of the Barge Canal. Um, and I found a lot of meaning in getting to know all the non-human neighbors there through our citizen science days and through learning how to restore habitat that's undergone a lot. Thank you. It's better to keep that one there. Uh, learning about restoration techniques, including uh, removing common buckthorn and uh, building community all along the way. And I want to echo some of the concerns that Andrew shared, um, particularly about uh, potential stormwater impacts. And you mentioned that compared to 453, the scale is much different and that there's not as in-depth um, studies going on to find out what those impacts might be. Um, to me, that feels disappointing, um, considering that the DEC does have this priority to protect human and human health and the environment. And um, as shown in the I rule that this plan shall not cause contaminant migration to Lake Champlain, pollutants travel. And when an ecosystem is not 
protected and respected and able to serve as a natural buffer for these pollutants, it, it just enhances the risk. And you mentioned, Graham, that part of your job, you're authorized to mitigate these risks. And I, and I heard also what you said about this um, conscious prioritization of development projects on brownfield sites. And I guess I just wonder about how that prioritizing comes into balance with this, um, with this promise to protect human health and the environment and with this promise to mitigate risks. Um, I wonder how the capping method that's being used here uh, can be justified when other remediation techniques are available um, that are more kind, that are more supportive, actively supportive to the existing ecosystem there. Uh, it just seems like a contradiction that it doesn't in fact mitigate potential risks. Um, and I just, just feel so called to Just so I can in. answer your question yeah, better. Thank you. What are the particular contaminants um, and risks that you're concerned about in terms of stormwater? Specific to this parcel. Yeah. Um, that aren't currently happening. I don't have specific uh, compounds to name, but I'm just aware that and phosphorus is one from land in general. Um, but I'm just aware that uh, with stormwater events, and particularly in Burlington with our uh, sewage system, I remember like multiple times I've been walking around, I think of the Halloween storm a couple years ago where I was coming home at night walking through sewage sludge. And that's- a, I mean, certainly a eutrophication and phosphorus is an issue in Vermont Lake Champlain. That's not what we're concerned about here with this particular property. I've been involved with research up at Lake Carmine into phosphorus entering the lake there. Um, so, I mean, the issue with stormwater here is are we changing the recharge to groundwater? Has any change to, or sorry, is the developer changing any uh, recharge to groundwater? Anything that might push contaminants closer to the canal, further towards the canal. And the cap has been developed in such a way that it's not gonna um, change that groundwater recharge and that groundwater flow in any significant way. And remember that there is also ongoing monitoring um, around the canal and the lake uh, and, that, and the so-called performing defendants, those responsible um, for maintaining that. Uh, we're, we're in touch every week. Um, uh, it seems like every week we're getting results from uh, um, the Maximus in that. Um, and those, that grant of environmental restrictions is not going away. That is there in perpetuity between the state and the landowner. So they, they, they have, they're required to maintain um, that situation that, and, and not um, alter the hydrology in any way that encourages contaminant transport towards the lake. So, Graham, if there were a migration that was noted by the various monitoring wells and, um, and the five-year um, testing by EPA, who would be responsible for um, addressing that? <laughs> well, now we're talking about monitoring on the Superfund site. Well, I mean, if, if it was determined that, the, uh, that um, a development on, uh, say, the site of the former manufactured gas plant caused um, a migration of contaminants that was noted in by the, the various wells, who, who is liable for that, um, that um, uh, addressing that if it needed to be addressed? If there, if there was a... Do you if I could answer that real quick? The, the responsibility for that lies no. with the property. So the responsibilities... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> As Grant mentioned, uh, it's part of the deed restrictions for these properties. So that's part of the institutional controls. 
whoever is the property owner and the signatory to that deed then bears the responsibility if one of the institutional controls are seem to be broken. And the institutional control that I'm asking about is, is migration of, of contaminant toward the lake. So um, could it be determined what caused that migration? If there, say, was this, this development this, on this small piece of property, could it be determined that that was the cause of it? Yeah, certainly. I, I think you could piece that together. Um, you know, if you, there's a lot of monitoring that happens on the Superfund site. And if there was a change to hydrogeologic, you know, the, the makeup of the site and the hydrogeologic -geo conditions of the site, that would probably be noted within the monitoring that's ongoing within the site. So that would, um, you know, raise a red flag and then we then we'd start looking at why that change has occurred. Um, so, we don't, you know, we're, we're approving this cap because um, the proposed remediation is designed to prevent that happening at this site. If it was, to, if we were to notice it elsewhere, then right. we'd have to look for. What but with all due respect, it. there, there, um, there are um, consequences sometimes that you hadn't anticipated, even environmental professionals sometimes, especially on a site like this that has, as EPA has noted, 56 contaminants of concern, and especially with the coal tar that you noted was 120 feet west of, uh, of the, the site, the gatehouse site, but still, if there were um, things that pushed that coal tar toward the west, toward the lake, I mean, Un so un unintended ground consequences. Groundwater would run through those pores, pick up PAHs from the napple, and continue naturally towards the lake. But groundwater is moving like that all the time, and what we're we're not changing the situation it, with, with this these actions on, on the site. It's it's to do with the um, uh, what, you know. What is, how much recharge is, what, is there any change to the recharge? What's the area? What's the thickness of that layer, that geological layer, that's transporting that groundwater through the ground? You make a small change to recharge on a small lot up there, that groundwater is coming from up gradient, traveling through that thicker layer underneath. This is relatively small impact compared to the total movement of groundwater through the site. And, and, we're mon and it's being monitored on the Superfund site to check, to make sure that there are no changes to either um, if there's any evidence of NAPL. And I've got to say that um, there isn't evidence of NAPL in wells directly down gradient. The, 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 the place where we do see coal tar is, is over here where this slew was. Um, here, um, that's where we're primar primarily looking at dissolved phase contaminants and to see if there's any increases in um, concentration. In actual fact, the, mo the, the focus on the, uh, 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 on the um, Superfund site in terms of dissolved phase contaminants is, uh, is between the lake and the canal. That's, that's uh, where the uh, highest density of monitoring is occurring. My name is Esme, and I, um, my understanding after hearing this meeting is that the purpose of what we plan to do with 501 is purely economic revitalization um, and not to worsen any of the environmental damage, not to better it either necessarily. I don't, I'm not quite seeing that in this plan. Um, and so if, if the goal is to not cause further harm, as well as promote economic uh, revitalization. I'm wondering um, sort of what the expected outcomes are economically for this development project. Maybe the landowner, um, the proposed like food truck project, how is that going to like, positively impact Burlington as an economy or maybe even as like a communal space? Like what are the 
like ways to measure like success moving forward as a result of this project. Like what can we look out for by making this choice? Like why is this the best choice? I just have to say that is kind of beyond the scope of this meeting ah. a bit. It's not really a zoning okay. meeting or you know it's not an economic development okay. meeting. Yes. Employ people. Employ people, okay. Service yep. that's already being provided down the road. Yeah. Okay. Well, if I might add something to that, <clears throat> since Kurt's gone ahead and, and, and responded, and that my, my name's Ruby Perry, I also live um, a block away. And I have attended the previous meetings, and thank you, Charlie, and, and left comments and, and made comments. And my um, the main comment I want to make today is that I am not sure that those kinds of things actually had been addressed. That at the that at the two uh, board commission meetings that I that I went to, a lot of concerns came up, and one of them was, what is the economic benefit? And other ones were, what about the traffic, and what's the benefit, and, and how is that going to be balanced with? Um, people who are trying to move along Pine Street. And there were also a lot of environmental comments. And I stayed after the comments. You know, in those meetings, we get to make public comment, but nobody responds. And I stayed after, and there was no discussion about those things. It was not considered the purview of either the DRB or the, the, the Design Review Board. So not traffic not environment, not commercial benefit, economic benefit. There was a slight discussion about aesthetics with lights, but it really never got discussed. It seemed like everybody on those boards felt the same thing that you did, was that our charge is to look at this very narrow thing and respond in an, uh, to the very narrow purview that, that we have. And I wonder where the real discussion takes place. I appreciate that Graham scheduled this meeting. He was asked to schedule it, but I'm glad that he did because it gives a chance for this public discussion to happen that hasn't happened despite municipal participation. Uh, besides, I mean, you have gone through the hoops, right? I can tell by the set of your jaw that you've gone through the hoops. But there, no real discussion has happened and I'm I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with the with the public being represented well. I'm not comfortable with the economic benefit and whether the lake and the barge canal is uh, actually a sacrifice zone to somebody's entrepreneurial instincts. Is that some is there some way should we not be balancing that at some point along the way? Um, I'm also, I'm not sure about the institutional controls. I'm not sure that David is totally right. I mean, I know that the accepted, uh, there's plenty of evidence that the, accept, that the expect, that accepted rules will work, that um, if you do this, this will happen. But the fact is that you are going to disturb the soil, you are going to cut down the trees that have, those are substantial trees that are holding that soil, which has a relationship to the water moving across that land. There's also anecdotal evidence that I suppose amounts in a meeting like this to gossip, but anecdotally, the owner of the, um, I think of it as GE plant, but of course it's the innovation center now, that he's concerned about, a, he cited a plume of contamination moving southwest under his parking lot from your spot, your, where you own, you, Kurt. And I don't, I, we have tried to track that down to see what that, where that came from. You know, is that, where did that come from? Where do we look? I mean, there are, as you say, gazillions of documents, but who's, who's monitoring that? Maybe you would know that. Maybe you would have seen that. Is there a plume of contamination moving southwest out of, out of the barge canal. I mean, we know that the Superfund site does not follow a boundary, right? A yellow boundary on a map. 
But do you, can you answer, have you heard nothing about that? I see you shaking your head, Graham, but I wonder about you. The anecdotal evidence of a plume moving underneath the parking lot, no, I have, I have not heard that. This is the first I'm hearing that. And if it were, you feel confident you would know that? I feel confident if there was significant movement of the plume that it would be borne out in the, uh, in the monitoring that's being done. Yes. Okay. Can you say that one more time? That if there was significant plume movement like you're describing, it would be evident within the monitoring. Okay. There is an annual report of all of the monitoring that's conducted of, of um, non-aqueous phase liquid coal tar in the well, the concentrations associated with the coal tar uh, of, of different contaminants. Uh, and uh, um, monitoring of sediment as well in, in the canal. Correct. Um, and um, EPA and DEC review that every year. Oh, he, they need you to say from for the camera who you represent and your name, please. Mark Habedank. Oh, we did that at the beginning. Yes. Um, and just by way of um, gossip again, or anecdotal evidence, um, uh, we, because we've talked with so many people, um, the Friends of the Barge Canal, uh, about the history of the canal, as, as well as the, document, the ongoing documentation. Um, we understand, and maybe you know, David, uh, this, since you, have a, you seem to have a little bit of historical knowledge, too, that those mounds that are right behind 501 Gate House, um, which we've speculated about, what are the mounds from? And we, we did finally hear that what they were was St. John's Ferry Trucking at some point was going to build um, a warehouse there. And uh, th uh, to, t I mean, this was long enough ago so that you probably were not involved. But to test that, its efficacy of that, um, they brought in all that soil and dumped it there. And what happened, we heard overnight, that's probably, that's probably an exaggeration. The soil sunk a foot because it's uh, not stable. Is that possible? There, there's an underlying, we're also getting off topic a bit here. And, I, and I'm kind of, I, I, I want to hear what you have to say because I'm also managing the rest of the site. Yeah. But I think it's just worth saying that, you know, the scope of this meeting really is 501 Gatehouse lot. But and the correct since, you, since you asked specifically <laughs> about subsidence, uh -huh. so this, this area was, um, you know, wetland by the lake, yeah. and there's a lot of organic material. There's a peat layer there. It was there. filled in by, there's a, yeah. by, with... Uh, there's a peat layer in there, yeah. and actually that peat layer has acted like a sponge, yes. and most of that... Um, sheen, coal tar sheen we see in coal tar uh, tends to be contained in that peat layer. Peat layer, the peat, um, uh, you load it on top, it's, it's, it's going to compress and potentially push um, the contamination out. So whatever work has to be done, uh, you know, or whatever work is proposed at the site, we, that is top of my priorities, you know, making sure that you don't compress that uh, peat layer, you don't move contamination around. So is that in the plan? I haven't heard that discussed, David. So it's, it's a bigger, those, it's, it's, it, that, is for, that is on other parts of the site. It's not an issue for the gatehouse lot, which is, not, which is. Not, is, not, the, can, not the buildings that he's putting on, the one that's upright. The gatehouse the lot. As far as I remember, is it, it's um, east of the peat layer. Just that small. So it, the peat, oh, the peat gets thicker is towards Lake Champlain. Ah, so it's all yeah. buried. So you really have to be able to see into the in three, to in three D. Yeah. yeah, it's in three D. As, as a geologist, that's uh, that's our thing. Thinking uh -huh. in in three D. Yeah. Right. And so actually four D because we're thinking in terms of. Migration as well. So the five hundred one gatehouse, where he's going to be putting the container, the, in the, if it hasn't changed from when the design review board, 
one of them will be vertical and one is as an um, Oh, that has changed then. So are there still two containers that will be on that lot? Four. Oh, there are four containers. And how much do they weigh? Would, did any, did you have to say that anywhere? Has anybody evaluating that? You can understand as a member of the public why so that's part of the curious. geotechnical engineering design. So who did the geotechnic engineering design? Was that Novus that did that? Mm -hmm. Who did that then? Then I could look at those documents and get those questions answered, right? You can contact me after if you want. Do you know who did that? No, then? there probably hasn't been any done yet. Oh, there hasn't. It, will it be required? Is there another where it, where it addressing the, um, the environmental concerns? So site. when will the, ge and the geological concerns are not the environmental concerns? No, that's linked in together, the groundwater flow. So I'm, now I'm asking a yes or no question. Will that be done? Does it need to be done? Yeah. No. <laughs> what, about, yep. what about you over there? Um, whose name I already forgot. I'm Mark. Very sorry. Mark. Mark. That's a question for the property owner. I don't know if there's geologic. There will be foundation work. Yes. So is there? All we're discussing sorry. The and mm -hmm. yes, but was there a report about the the geologic movement on, uh, that would be happening? So the, it, the, I mean, this is a this is a geotechnical issue. It depends yes. on the soil properties, and and you know, the peat is further west. That's the problematic layer. Mm -hmm. in terms of but it's also in terms of loading we're just talking about containers here a uh, um, different issue at 453 where there's buildings and there's a lot of work being put into the geotechnical mm -hmm. design this is this is a okay. food, food so look there is no geologic geotechnic design because you didn't you weren't required to do that which you know which is you can understand my concern about that but i hear that and i don't want to take up more time than it's you know, than it's allotted. So I, I appreciate arriving at that, at least. And I thank you, Ashley, for raising the question which got it going in my mind. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good questions. Worth asking, definitely. I don't have any more gossip. <laughs> I would have mentioned it. Oh, well, there is one, but I'll save it for another. Okay. Any other questions on the corrective action plan? <laughs> oh, you want to stay on top? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my name is Colton. Uh, I am a mentor of kids in nature. Um, and I am uh, just, like, concerned about, and, like, and, and I know this is kind of outside the spectrum of uh, the what you're putting a lot of. It, no, it, it, the correct, it is very specific with the corrective action plan. And that's just the definition of human health. What does that mean? How are we engaging with our health? And I, I think that the environmental correction plan is overlooking like a lot of concerns that have been raised here tonight. And I also think that uh, looking at human health, like what precedent is this setting for human health and how we're engaging with our environment and how we're engaging with, this is like one of the last wild spaces in downtown Burlington. And there are actually like animals that run through this neighborhood. I live right up the road here and I see, I've had like 10 sightings of fox in this area and multiple sightings of deer in this area. There are pathways through and they live amongst us. If you walk the streets at night, you will actually see animals out. So with that said, I think that we are integrated with the health of our environment. And I think there are, you all are looking at this from like your perspective of like, the job that you've been given. But I, I think that at, on like a human to human level, like I believe that there is broader, like the term like that you're using, human health is much broader than the categories that were laid out. 
in this tiny presentation. And I also think that the direction, the precedent that like a project like this is kind of setting for us engaging with wild spaces, one of like, and I know maybe you wouldn't define this as a wild space. You clearly, all of Conservation space, land around the... Uh, I know, but, but within those boxes and within that little teeny tiny box, there is life living that's going to be destroyed. And I think that that is very much integral with the health of the lake, with the health of me living in this neighborhood, with the health of all the other, with the health of the kids who live in that neighborhood, with the health of all the people who live in that neighborhood. And I think it impacts everybody who drinks from that lake and everybody who swims in that lake. I appreciate your comments. I yeah, really and I do. Also, I, I, um, Last night I was watching four skunks and two raccoons on our porch. <laughs> the animals coming through. Yeah, and I, I spent a lot of my time doing that. Yeah, I also within just, this room I've yeah. got my hat on as a yeah. DEC. I get that. And I just want to say thank you for all taking time to be here. I know you have lives outside of mm -hmm. this. Andrew, uh, for most of the questions, I think there might be one or two extras. For most of them, um, I already responded. Um, so we'll be thinking carefully. And um, there is still a week. To there's, uh, The um, public comment period is kept open for a week after the meeting. So if you think of anything else, or if you want to put what you said in writing tonight, uh, uh, feel free to contact me. I just realized I don't have my email on there, but uh, I can I can give that to you if anybody wants to. Um, and that's the way to make public comments is just to email you? That's the easiest way. Yeah, make sure I get them and respond to them. Otherwise, I think we um, will end it there for this evening. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.